Thank you very much um, for um, inviting me for um, for, for this uh, for this interesting event. And um, and and uh, Nutsha has already told us quite a bit about the um, um, about the settings in which people coexist with reindeer. And um, uh, this presentation is built a little bit um, as a as a pair of of this. And um, I would like you to introduce to some of the research that uh, we've been doing. Um, in the Russian Arctic, um, most of my research is about that, and, and, and I'm going to share with you some thoughts on how the study of these relations between people, animals, and the environments can also inform our thinking about sustainable livelihoods in the Arctic. Um, and like, like Nutsho, I'm also an, an anthropologist, and I'm going to um, do this presentation from the point of view of an anthropologist. Um, so, so I just thought, since we have a general audience, I... Um, explain that anthropology is really the science of human cultural and social diversity and similarity across the planet. So we study what forms of human social life we can find on this planet and what are the factors that influence these forms of life and how diverse or similar these forms are across groups of people, occasions, states, ecological habitats and climatic zones. So obviously there are some basics that every group of people leading a particular way of life needs to ensure. For example, people need to eat something all over the planet. People need to have a shelter to live under, need to satisfy their basic health conditions, reproduce, have appropriate clothing and so on. But there are many different ways of ensuring these basics. And these are culturally and socially different. And then, on top of these basic needs, people have a lot of more elaborate needs, desires, hopes, fears, and anxieties in their lives that are also influenced by their culturally embedded forms of life and their relations to their surrounding natural and social environments. And so this is what anthropologists study. And, um, and this is why you will now get a different perspective on some similar things uh, from myself based on a different region than what Nutra has told us uh, about Finnish Lapland. Um, so what I would like to suggest in this presentation and try to show you in the following is that the description of how people actually live on the land in real time today in the 21st century uh, can teach us already quite a bit for our own life too on how we can organize ourselves sustainable on this planet. And when anthropologists describe the life that they live with people in the field. They call this ethnography. So on the following slides, you will see a lot of photographs from my own living with Yamal and its nomads in West, Siber in West Siberia, which is the red little dot on the map that you see here on the slide. Um, and all those photos are taken in the last two years. And actually the last photos I just did um, three weeks ago when I was celebrating New Year's with the reindeer herders in the tundra, which you see here. Um, there are some cases of environments um, that you cannot just ignore. And I think the Arctic is one of these cases of environments that you cannot ignore. Um, and it is because for human inhabitation, these environments bear some challenges. Um, for example, the challenge of dealing with the cold. On this photo, the temperature was around 42 degrees minus. Um, I have lived myself for 30 years in more temperate environments before moving to Rovaniemi um, at the Arctic Circle. And I've noticed myself that when you live there, every day when you stand up, the first thing to do is checking the weather, the temperature, the precipitation, the daylight, all these environmental variables that I have never checked myself when I lived in Cambridge or in Germany before. Because these things actually have a real impact on your everyday life. And I think this is something that makes life in the Arctic different from other places uh, with a more temperate climate. Um, we can give a fancy sounding scientific name to this rather banal finding. Um, and I would like to call this the corporeality of the Arctic. So it's the physical conditions of life that actually counts in the Arctic. Um, one of the most obvious factors for that is temperature. Um, it's cold and people need to invent appropriate shelter from that cold. 
he just see one way of shelter in the form of the nomad, nomadic tent. In Sami, it's called the lava. In then it's um, it's called the mya, and in Russian, the chum. Uh, temperature and daylight in the Arctic obviously influence also what kind of vegetation grows there and how much of it grows there and how fast. And this means that the corporeality of the Arctic determines um, also what you can do on the land. And for example, growing plants and this kind of sedentary agriculture um, is one way of life that does not Um, in these Arctic ice deserts, um, you cannot really grow any plants anymore. So what did people do for inventing uh, ways of adapting and living sustainable in these environments? Nutsha has told us already, the best known invention is uh, herding reindeer. Many of the people in the Eurasian Arctic do that. Um, but they did not invent that in the North American Arctic, for example, where there is also a cold climate. And this is what tells us um, about the necessity to actually study, study these cultural specific forms. My examples today come from this West Siberian group called the Yamalinets, and they nowadays hold the world's largest domestic reindeer herds. And they still live in that pastoralist relation with the reindeer that Nutcher was talking about and showing on one of his slides, where he said that the Sami are ranchers by now, the Nenets are still pastoralists, which means they live with the reindeer around the year, around the clock, basically. One could say in Nutcher's last diagram, um, if you remember, which had that stage, these eight stages, I think the Nenets are now at stage four, with the intensive herding. The basic starting point for this relation of people with their animals is domestication. And this is a topic that we currently study together also with Nutcher in a project by the Finnish Academy called Wire, Wild Realities. Um, domestication is a relation that's ongoing and already Zoyner in 1963 argued that the domestication is a meeting ground where um, the media of the two species, the humans and the animals overlaps. And in the case of this rain of reindeer, Zoyner had already argued in the 1960s that the meeting ground is constituted by a common mobile relation to space. And that mobile relation to space among the nanites, you can see that particularly well, it's, it's, um, it's enacted through migration of people and reindeer together through the landscape. So I invite you to look carefully at this picture the nice thing about living with the Yamalinets is that you can actually see this relation unfolding in real time when you are there and feel that relation yourself uh, rather than having to rely on archival materials or interviewing people only. Um, and from there, actually, you can understand and even feel with your own body um, what it means when, for example, colleagues like Charles Stepanov, a famous French anthropologist, writes that um, uh, the migration is the territory as it is perceived and memorized by humans and animals forming a shared nomadic landscape. Um, in most reindeer herding settings, this physical relations of people to the land was or is mediated by the reindeer. And if you look carefully at the sledge and the woman, uh, you see that is the reindeer feet that touch the ground, uh, whereas the human sits on a sledge um, so, so, so the human is actually not touching the ground, him or herself. It's the reindeer who touches the ground. So the reindeer mediates the physical relation between people and the land. Um, and you can see that really well. In much of Europe, as Lutra has shown us, this physical relation is basically lost because nowadays reindeer use, reindeer herders use snowmobiles, quad, quadrocycles, mankeia, powered by imported energy, which uh, we may say is inherently less sustainable, but sometimes more efficient. A um, mobile relation to space, of course, is a crucial determinant of people's relation to environment in the Arctic. And originally, most human inhabitants in the Arctic had nomadic ways of life. In the Yamalnets case, that you can still observe how they cover thousands of kilometers every year. But unfortunately, like it or not, 
um, the colonization of the Arctic by states with capitals in the south, such as Helsinki, sorry to say that, um, has led to the decline of that mobile relation of Arctic peoples to, the, to their environment. There are actually very few people left who still have that full in nomadic way of life like the Nenets have. Um, sedentarization, so the, the, the process of becoming settled is a rather common phenomenon for nomads worldwide, not only for the Arctic. Um, and it's not necessarily one that helps sustainability. Um, and the reason for that is that when you settle in an environment where the resources are scarce, for example, the plants, they are not dense, they are scattered, and the growing period is slow, or the water resources are scarce, you are actually well advised to use a vast territory to feed yourself and your animals. Um, that relation, that ecological relation of nomadism has been observed already back in the 70s in Dyson Hudson and Smith's economic defendability model of nomadism. So it's not new, um, but it's a very basic relation that rather than having your animals graze in one spot all the time and not having the pastures available anymore next year, um, you change the pastures all the time and you're able to come back. Um, for doing that, you need to drive your ranger to new places all the time. And that's what you see on this picture. Um, of course, people in cities like this, um, these are the minority, uh, majority, majority of the Arctic population today also rely on animals to feed on. And if you look carefully at this photograph that I took just, um, it, I took it actually on the 30th of December, so three weeks ago in Salihart, the capital of Yamal, they are putting up the logo of KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken there. So they also eat animals, um, but these animals are not necessarily local. And the people who eat these animals do not um, hurt them anymore themselves, and they do not um, eat their own meat. Um, so, so this is an inherent sustainability challenge. Think about how much of the stuff on this picture that people use in their everyday life is imported from outside the Arctic, using a lot of resources that are neither near renewable nor produced by the people locally. So this means that nowadays, most Arctic people, even the descendants of those people who were nomads at some point, they are dependent on these outside resources that someone else produces on their behalf and then imports them there. And the local people need to pay for them. And a lot of this is, of course, a result of our states colonizing the Arctic. Settled people on one place in the Arctic spoil the environment more than the nomads did traditionally because the land under their houses and around their houses usually cannot be used anymore to sustain animals that feed people. In, the, in such places of settlement, uh, like on this picture, um, these are usually too polluted to serve as reindeer pastures or as resource givers uh, in the more general sense in a sustainable way. On this photo is, the, is a gas uh, deposit in Yamal, um, which the Nenets reindeer herders I have been living with pass by twice a year on their migration route, just by the road. Obviously, a lot of the land surrounding it is not fit for human inhabitation even anymore. Um, so the causal chain here relating to sustainability is like this. If you import a lot of stuff to the Arctic to live there, you need a lot of energy to transport it. A lot of this energy is actually located in the Arctic on deposits like here. For example, in Yamal, 90% of the Russian gas is located. And actually, Finland imports a lot of this gas. Um, but then this gas was shipped out of the out of the Arctic from where it's uh, extracted to the south, and then it's used to bring back resources uh, that are produced in the south to the Arctic. Um, for example, tropical fruits, construction materials for these houses, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and so on. So we can say that this sort of sedentary logic that have people being located in one place and moving around the goods may be a sustainability challenge in comparison to the livelihood where actually the people and the animal move together and produce what they need locally. Um, just to give you some, some idea of how we anthropologists think sometimes theoretically. <clears throat> um, but that, of course, that sustainability of the nomads too depends on um, 
how you organize your movement and how much of renewable energy, for example, you, you use in that movement, for example, animal power, as you have seen on the previous slide. But this raises the question, what can we learn from making our life sustainability in the Arctic? Does one have to become a nomad to live sustainably there? I think that would be illusionary. But um, I'm trying to show that uh, from living with those people, we can maybe question some of, the, some of our own thinking about sustainable lifestyles. We may become more humble as, relate, as we relate to people who are much better than we in using local resources efficiently. Um, one thing that we can think about from living with nomads is the way in which we frame our relations to the environment. Um, in our background, which is the background of all Arctic, it's, it's the dominant way in which Arctic states have been teaching their citizens to relate to the environment, is actually inspired by the Bible. Subdue the resources of the land and extract what you can, to put it shortly. So that sees humans as superior beings in the environment, with the power to do with our surroundings what we want. Um, and this, of course, has consequences, as we can see on our planet, for the state of the environment. Um, so now, basically, that we have, with our way of life, destroyed part of our planet, now we need to reinvent sustainability in those new conditions. And we can ask ourselves, what does the study of nomadic societies like the Nenets or the Sami teach us um, for reinventing that sustainability? And um, because in the Nenets and other indigenous Arctic groups, people settings, uh, humans are equal beings in the environment alongside animals, plants, water dog bodies, mountains, lakes, and also spirits. And in those people's original belief systems, there is not really a hierarchy of who is more important than whom. That means human cannot necessarily assume that plants and animals need to sacrifice themselves for human lives. If you take from them, you also need to give to keep everything in a balance. That's at least the idea. Um, however, we also have to admit many Arctic peoples may not even remember anymore that they had such a worldview some time ago. The Nenets, many of the Nenets elders still have, uh, but this is also fading among the young generation. Um, but the point here is, um, and in anthropology we call this uh, belief system animism, uh, is that every being in the environment has a soul and therefore um, requires to be treated with respect and reciprocity. Um, and on this picture, you'll see, for example, the spirit master of the ranger herd among the Nenets sitting together with people in their house, in their tent. Um, and this is actually one of those leading ranger that Neutral has been talking about. Um, so so this, is, this is how that works. <coughs> and I'm going through some of these just as photos to show you the closeness of that relation between ranger and people, how it is uh, enacted. Um, today, um, but this does not mean, however, that ranger nomads all are all sort of ecological saints. Uh, some of them, for example, also do not separate rubbish, dispose of plastic bags in the open tundra, use new, more and more cow power generators, snowmobiles in the tundra, or they use poison um, for helping the reindeer to get rid of the mosquitoes in summer, as you see here. So on the one hand, this is caring about the well-being of the animal, but it's also poisoning um, because this, is, this stuff is highly poisonous. They used to make smoke fires in the past. Um, but still, all these relations, they, they display a lot of care for the well-being of the animals, as people know that it is directly related to the well-being of the people. Here, for example, they put fabric on the road and on the sand dam of the gas deposit um, in order to make it easier for the reindeer to move through it so that they wouldn't strangle their, um, with their harnesses, their, their throats as they were hauling the household over. Um, and also closeness, of course, does not exclude death um, because death is part of human life and it's also part of animal life. And it's normal that uh, you kill you kill the animals in an appropriate and respectful way. In this case, you can see here dedicated it to the spirits um, to enact this reciprocal relationship where it's quite normal that you eat those animals. Um, 
Um, so, so it's all about, it's, it's not about sort of in, in order to, to be sustainable, you necessarily have to become a vegetarian or um, things like that, as we hear sometimes from people living in big cities. Um, but it's about, it's about respecting that every being in the, in the environment um, has their own justification of existence. Um, and this is, I think, something that we can learn really well um, from, from these people. Um, of course, we also can admit, um, and I can, as somebody who has lived for probably now after, now after having conducted 20 years of fieldwork with the people, I spent several years with the nomads there, and there's no way I would live that, that way of life permanently, although I enjoy that. Uh, a lot being with them, but I also enjoy living in a big house every time I return. Uh, so that leads us to this question, what can we actually learn from our own thinking? Um, and and um, I think one, one way is that the nomads in their everyday life are superior to us, thinking about what they really need, um, because their way of life, their mobility teaches them to become minimalist. Um, and that's something that one, we can take away as sort of something that is, um, that is in general maybe a good thing to think about in our affluent society. Um, and um, maybe one doesn't have to be a nomad in order to implement some of this stuff. Um, for example, in small villages in the Arctic, there are also still many people who, who live a lot of the resources of their own land. Um, fish their own fish, hunt their own meat, pick their own berries and mushrooms, use bicycle more than cars, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and one other thing that we can learn is that uh, people are great in reusing stuff that gets out of order. They are great in repairing things, in reinterpreting uses of material uh, value that they find maybe on a rubbish dump of an industrial company or something like that, for example, I've been witnessing them using old plastic pipes uh, that they screw them under the sledges to protect, to protect the wood from being uh, worn out too fast, something like that. So in our own households, we can actually think about a lot of this stuff um, as well if we want. And of course, living in Rovaniemi, for example, I can, I can think myself, does it actually have to be the kangaroo meat from Australia that I buy? Or can it be the hirviliha, the moose meat from my neighboring hunter um, that, um, that, that I can consume? Um, so I just thought towards the end, I share some of these examples for showing the, the way of thinking that living with such nomads um, sort of teaches us can also influence um, a researcher's own life. Um, while not at all, I'm saying that I'm an ecological saint whatsoever. My hobby is old cars, for example. So, so, um, so I'm anything but a saint, just as the reindeer herders are not. Um, um, but it makes us think that it may be worth to appreciate that we still have these way of life around in the Arctic. It's worth investing in um, keeping these ways of life alive. And they can inform our own thinking about sustainability now that we need it so much in a changing climate. Thank you.